You know, being at peace and being content in life is a wonderful and powerful thing. But it can be hard to do. So many times it seems like evil people, wicked people, are doing so well and have so much. And so many times godly people have, don't seem to have what they need. And it's tough to be content in those circumstances unless you understand what's going on. Why is it that the wicked seem to prosper? Why is it that God's people seem to have so many needs so often? Well, there's reasons for that. And like I say, if we understand those reasons, then that goes a long way to helping us be content and be blessed in this world. Now, we're going to start with the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul had a thorn in the flesh. This is in 2 Corinthians 12. And <laughs> he didn't like it, you know, and he complained to the Lord about it. He went to the Lord about it. He prayed to the Lord about it. And we read about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 8. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this so that it would depart from me. This thorn in the flesh would go away. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power reaches its fulfillment in weakness. And it's, it can be hard to understand that, but it's really true. If you look, for example, at the, the, the Job... Here's Job, and he had, he was wealthy, and he was healthy, and he had a wonderful family, and, you know, he's blessed, and it's like, wow, things are going well for him. But he's a powerful testimony because when he lost those things, he continued to be content, he continued to worship God, and then God, of course, blessed him back, which is pretty much a parable of what will happen for people that are godly in this life. You know, if, you're, if you are godly through your circumstances in this life, in the next life, God will truly bless you. Christ said you'll have many times more in the next life than you had in this life if we can be godly and understand what's going on. And so Paul then writes, you know, therefore I will most gladly boast all the more in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ will rest on me. Because it's when we're in need and we rest on Christ and are content and are blessed and stay thankful that the true power and grace of Christ shines forth. And verse 10 says, therefore on behalf of Christ, I am content in weaknesses in being mistreated, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am powerful. And what does he mean by that? How can you be powerful when you're weak? It's a powerful witness of the grace of God. And that's what Christ had said. You know, my grace is sufficient for you. And that's a lot of our understanding that God's grace is sufficient for us in this life. But that still doesn't answer the question, does it? How did the wicked get into power? How do they stay in power? Because they've been in power. <laughs> Gosh, the wicked have been in power since Cain and Abel. For, for 6,000 years, the wicked have been in power. How has this happened? What's going on here? Well, first of all, the testimony of the scripture that it actually is happening. And we'll see why. Let's go to Luke chapter 4. And in Luke chapter 4, the devil comes to Jesus Christ to tempt him. And here's what the devil says in Luke chapter 4, and starting in verse 5. And he, the devil, led him, Jesus, up and showed him all the kingdoms of the inhabited world in a moment of time. The devil just gave Jesus a panoramic war view of the inhabited world. In verse 6, and the devil said to him, to you, I will give all this authority and their glory for it has been handed over to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. Now, this is huge. We need to understand that when Adam and Eve sinned, remember from Genesis chapters 1 and 2, God had given the power and authority and dominion of the world to Adam and Eve. And God's not an Indian giver. When Adam and Eve sinned, God didn't say, well, I'm taking it back. You know, God, God is not going to take back what he had given. When Adam and Eve sinned, the power that God had given them transferred to the devil because they were recognizing the devil and his power and his provision instead of God's. And so basically Adam and Eve handed over 
dominion of the world to the devil. Now, this is um, not commonly taught because people say, well, God's God, so God's got to be in control. No, God isn't in control. Well, and, and you know that. Now, does God have ultimate control? Will he ultimately win the fight? Yes, but he doesn't micromanage. He gives his creatures free will. You know that. You have free will. If you want to walk into a store and steal something, you can. And God's not going to send an angel to stop you. You know, if you want to lie, you can. If you want to be lazy, you can. If you want to be disobedient, you can. Why can you do those things? Because God honors the free will he gave people. And the devil has free will too. And so the devil became the adversary, the opposer, lots of names for the devil where he's against God. And he says, you know, all the authority of the world has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to and that's important. Why are the wicked in power? Why, how have the wicked managed to stay in power? And they've managed to stay in power because the devil has the dominion of the world and he gives it to anyone he wants to. He elevates his people. He helps them out. He makes sure that they get advantages. The devil is immoral. He's illegal. He doesn't mind overstepping bounds. He doesn't mind hurting people. And the devil's people certainly hurt people to get what he wants. So the, the devil is immoral and illegal, and through immoral, illegal, and, and knowledgeable means, he puts his people in power, absolutely. And the devil offered all this power to Jesus. If you will bow down and worship me, uh, in worship before me, it will all be yours, said the devil. But Jesus, of course, said, no, we're supposed to worship God, and Jesus knew that he would get everything in time if he would be obedient to God. And that's true of us too. And that's why we can be content because we know that if we are godly here, and like Paul said, you know, when I am weak, then I am strong. If we can really have that attitude and if we understand why the wicked are in power, then you see we're in a position to be content here on earth and have great rewards in the future. Now, more about the devil being in control. It says that very plainly in 1 John 5, 19. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in the power of the wicked one. You know, and this is, uh, that translation is, is very common, a, a translation like that. The ESV, the English Standard Version, says the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. The NIV says the whole world is under the control of the evil one. The NLT says the world around us is under the control of the evil one. The uh, Christian Standard Bible says the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. The evil one has genuine power, and he's had genuine power for ages, ages. God, Adam and Eve handed over the power in the Garden of Eden. And so for the entire existence of humankind, who's had the power on earth? The devil. And so what, what do we see right away? The first two human beings, Cain and Abel. And Abel's a godly person, and he's doing things right, and Cain is an ungodly person, and he's not doing things right. So who has the ascendancy? Cain, right? Yes, <laughs> the evil one, because the devil helps him. And so that Cain was angry at God, Yahweh, in verse 6 of Genesis chapter 3, but Genesis chapter 4, rather, Genesis 4, 6. Yahweh said to Cain, why are you angry? <laughs> if you do well, in verse 7, will you not be accepted? Uh, you know, and that's true. If you do well, won't you be accepted? Well, you know, Cain didn't want to do well. Yeah. You know, evil people don't like obeying God. Evil people don't like humbling themselves to God. That's why so many evil people don't come to Jesus Christ. And Cain didn't like humbling himself to either. He, he liked to be, have the ascendancy. He liked to be in control by, by power and by force. And so what do we see? Verse 8, Cain said to Abel, his brother, let's go out into the field. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. That's an easy way. Okay, Abel's, Abel's being accepted by God. I'm not. What am I going to do about this? He could have said, I'm going to do what it takes to be accepted. <laughs> that would have been nice. Instead, what's he say? I'm going to kill Abel off. That's the way evil people are. They don't want to change. They just want to get rid of godly people. 
And that's been happening for the, the totality of human existence. And so, interestingly enough, and, and the, they're not sorrowful about that. They're not remorseful about that. You know, Yahweh, in verse 9, Yahweh said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? First of all, he's a liar. He did know where Abel was. Abel was dead. He killed him. And secondly, he, he obviates his inner feelings. Am I my brother's keeper? Should I care about other people? I don't care about other people. That's the way evil people are. How do they get ascendancy? Because the devil says, you see all the authority of the world? It was given to me. And I can give it to anybody I want to. Well, who's he, who does the devil want to give power to? He wants to give power to evil people. Absolutely. And this we see through the history. So, okay, we're at Cain and Abel. We're about 4,000 B.C., roughly. And Cain kills Abel. So we move forward about 1,600 years. Now we get to the flood of Noah. What's the situation in Noah's time? The situation in Noah's time is evil people are in control, and they're so vastly in control. That, that righteous people no longer have the power to do anything about it. And, and so God just simply says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wipe everybody out with a flood. And that happened in Genesis 6 and 7, the flood of Noah. And God wiped out the people of the earth with a flood. Why? And saved Noah and his family. Why? Because there was so much evil. What does it say in, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5? Yahweh saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And that's how that's how bad things had become, and that's again about about 1,600 years after Cain and Abel, and and nothing had changed. So now we move forward again to about 2,000 B.C. So about halfway through the Old Testament, and contemporaneous basically with Abraham is a man named Job. Okay, so what's the situation in Job's time? Job talks about that in Job 21. And he, he's more or less complaining to God and complaining to his evil comforters. And he says in Job chapter 21, verse 7, Why do the wicked keep on living, becoming old, and, and also, yes, and grow mighty in power? Verse 8, their descendants are established with them before their face and their offspring before their eyes. Verse 9, their houses are safe from fear, nor is the rod of God upon them. Verse 10, their bulls breed without fail, their cows calve and do not miscarry. Verse 11, they send forth their little boys like a flock, their children dance. Verse 12, they sing to the tambourine and harp and rejoice to the sound of the pipe. Verse 13, they spend their days in prosperity and go down to Sheol. That's the grave, the state of death, in peace, meaning, you know, they, they just live long, prosperous lives, and then they die in peace. Verse 14, yet they say to God, depart from us, for we have no desire to know your ways. Verse 15, they also say, who is the Almighty? that we should serve him. And what profit will we have if we pray to him? Like I said, you know, the wicked people, they, they don't want to obey God. They don't want to humble themselves. But look how they prosper and grow mighty. Why is that? <laughs> we read it in Luke 4. It's because the devil, in John, 1 John 5, 19, the devil's in control of the world. He says, I have all this authority and I give it to whoever I want to. And who does the devil help through life? Who does he help make decisions? Why is it that all the animals breed and don't miscarry of the wicked people and that kind of thing? The devil is in there helping people. Why? Because he wants his people to be at the top of society. And then society can be ruled by the devil and by the devil's people. And that makes things kind of miserable here on earth sometimes. And what happens then is if we don't understand that, we can be discontent. And we can be upset and disempowered. But if we understand why the wicked rule, see, that doesn't keep us from thanking God because God's given us a future. God's given us a hope. There's going to be a time when there aren't going to be any more wicked people. And if we will keep that in mind and just do what Paul said, my strength, you know, is perfected in weakness. You know, that's, that's uh, the, the great witness 
to godly people and godliness. The great witness to the power of that is the fact that we're willing to be thankful and blessed and content in tough circumstances. This is Jesus Christ. I mean, that's what Jesus Christ came and it says he came to, to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus Christ, if anybody shouldn't have had to live in bad circumstances, it would have been the Lord Jesus. If you think about it, he, ought, he was king. He, he ought to just come as king, kill all the wicked people and be done. He will. But not the first time he came. And that's going to come later. Okay, we're, we were at 2000 BC. Let's go forward a thousand years. Let's go to Asaph the psalmist. And now we're at a thousand BC. And what does Asaph say in Psalm 73, starting in verse 3? He says, For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. <laughs> time of Cain and Abel, the wicked are winning. Time of the flood, the wicked are winning. Time of Job, the wicked are in power and they're prosperous. Go forward. Now it's 1000 BC and what do we see? The, the wicked are prosperous. <laughs> Verse 4, for there, there are no pains in their death, but their belly is fat. What does that mean? A lot of people as they get close to death, you know, they're in a lot of pain and stuff. But these people, they, they, there's no pain in their death. Their belly is fat. Verse 5, the troubles of other men are not theirs, nor are they afflicted like other people. Verse 6, therefore, pride is their necklace. A garment of violence covers them. And that's right. See, evil people follow the devil. They're immoral. They're illicit. Um, they don't mind overstepping bounds. They don't mind hurting people to get what they want and to get a powerful position in life. And so they become powerful and wicked and fat and prosperous. Um, verse 7, <laughs> their eyes bulge out from their fatness. They're so, they're so wealthy and stuff. Their heart overflows with delusions. They mock and speak evil. They arrogantly seek oppression. In verse 9, they've set their mouth against the heavens. That's what we read in Job. The wicked speak against God. They set their mouth against the heavens. Their tongue walks through the earth. In verse 11, and they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge with the Most High? Verse 12, behold, these are the wicked. Being always at ease, they increase in wealth. In verse 13, this is very powerful because it's the temptation that the righteous fall in. See, when we're not content, when we don't understand, when we don't have an understanding of why the wicked are prospering and what will be the value to us in the future if we stay thankful and godly and content, if we don't know those things, then you, you begin to think like Asaph, uh, Psalm 73, 13, surely in vain I've kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. Well, it's not in vain. And see, thankfully, if you read the full psalm of Psalm 73, Asaph gets it. He sees the destruction of the wicked. He sees the value of godliness. And he, he changes and becomes blessed and thankful. And that's good. But we have to understand it's the, it's the knowledge and the understanding of why things are the way they are that help us in these tough situations. Now, let's go forward a few hundred years. Here's Jeremiah. We're now at 600 B.C. What does Jeremiah say? <laughs> you are righteous, Yahweh, when I bring a case against you. Yet I would speak to you about your justice. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why are those who deal in treachery at ease? You've planted them and they've taken roots. They grow and they also bring forth fruit. You're near in their mouth, but far from their heart. That's what Asaph has said. That's what Job had said. So what do we see? The wicked are prospering in the time of Cain and Abel. They're the ones in power at the time of the flood. They're the ones in power at the time of Job. They're the ones in power at the time of Asaph, 1000 BC. They're the ones in power at the time of Jeremiah, 600 BC. Now let's go forward 600 years to the time of Christ. And you have the, the rulers in Jerusalem, particularly the Sadducees, and then the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And these are the rulers, and they're incredibly wealthy, we learn from history. They're incredibly wealthy, and they, they live in big houses, and they, they rule the Jewish world and make decisions over the lives of the Jewish people. And what does Jesus say to them in John 8, 44? Does he say, you guys are great, you guys are righteous, thank you for doing such a wonderful job? No! <laughs> John 8, 44, he says, you are of your father the devil. He looks at these religious leaders. 
And he knows the kind of oppressive rules they put in place and how they oppress people and hurt people and steal things from people. And how, the, the for example, the money changers steal people's money. And, it's, and, and they set up the system and they control it and they take a profit from it, from stealing from innocent people. And they're the religious leaders. And what does, what does, Paul, what does uh, Jesus say? You were of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. This is John 8, 44. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks out of his own character, for he's a liar and the father of them. And, you know, if you go forward in the book of Acts, you see things like um, when Paul went to the island of Cyprus and, and he's with the ruler there, the Roman ruler. And who's the Roman ruler's main advisor? A child of the devil. You know, when you look at Pontius Pilate, was he a godly man? You know, he could have decided, he, you know, he's not going to crucify Christ. The devil puts evil people in power. And the power of, of us is that we're content, we're thankful, we're godly, and we understand. We understand how did those wicked people get there? And how do those peop wicked people stay there? And when we understand that, and we understand their final end, and we understand our final end, and the rewards we'll receive for being godly, then we're in a position to be content and to be thankful. There's great power and peace and a wonderful life in understanding and being content, content, godly, and thankful. God bless you. Thank you so much for watching liking and commenting on this video and please hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on any of our future content and if you'd like to consider donating to help with making videos like this please go to truthortradition.com front slash donate god bless you